Let's hone in on this headline story now. Racial tensions in the free state town of Sienekal are expected to continue this week. EFF members are expected to descend on the town's magistrate's court to attend the bail hearing of the two men accused of murdering 21-year-old farm manager Brendan Horner. Now, EFF leader Julius Malema has called for the party's ground forces to defend state property and democracy, quote unquote. Now last week, a group of angry white farmers stormed that court, destroying state property and setting fire to a police van. A 52-year-old man was arrested in connection with that incident and he's facing charges of causing malicious damage to property and inciting public violence. Let's unpack the story now with uh, Wits University's Vice Chancellor, that's Professor Adam Habib, who joins us now via our video line. Prof, good morning. Thanks very much for your time. I think let's perhaps begin with what uh, has unfolded in the EFF, some of the statements being made by the party's leadership and the CIC, in fact. I mean, fairly irresponsible, that's, that's a fair comment to make, irresponsible statements from Julius Malema, given how high the tensions in Senegal are already. So I think it's an irresponsible statement. I've, I, I, you know, my question is, why are we surprised? This is classic uh, Julius Malema behavior. Here's the problem. Uh, in a lot of ways, what the farmers did or what the protesters did at Senegal was unacceptable. Uh, it was violence, it was political violence, however legitimate your cause. Yeah. You do not have the right to go in, break into a jail, and burn a police vehicle. It's just unacceptable political behavior. But you know, to be honest, as much, and I think people need to be identified, and they need to be charged, and action needs to be taken. Having said that, I'm not in the least bit surprised. This has become a pattern of behavior. Unions do it all the time. Uh, the EFF do does it all the time. Political parties and community organizations do it all the time. And so in a sense, we, we moan and groan about child violence and violence against women. But every one of us tolerates political violence when it suits us. Mm. And I think it's particularly hypocritical of the EFF. The EFF is just, if you like, annoyed that a group of white farmers do exactly what they did for all these years. And that's the problem. And frankly, if we as a society and if government doesn't get its act together and it doesn't start dealing with these issues, we are going to have a, a, a state of complete lawlessness where violence is the norm and the only way you get protection is if you hire some muscle because you can't rely on the police, who are the most incompetent lot you can come across. So I'm, I think it's particularly irresponsible. I frankly would like uh, action to be taken against the individual farmers who are guilty of this. But I frankly want action to be taken against people like the EFF, who continuously take this country to the brink of violence and then claim that uh, they didn't mean to do so. Mm. I think this is no longer acceptable behavior, and we need to be, to be firm as a country and as government. But this is, this is how we deal with our issues in our country, isn't it, Prof? Th this is how we get, this is how our communities get government's attention when it comes to service delivery, when it comes to gender-based violence. This is how we do it. Yes, but then how can you have this kind of violence mm. and then say, I don't like the the violence against women, or we run these campaigns against violence against women, or violence against children, or campaigns in the Cape Flats against gang violence. How the hell do you expect to get out of any of this if we, as a society, tolerate this? You know, you, in an earlier conversation with your colleagues, you spoke about corruption, and that the people, it's a corruption frenzy that is happening. Well, how do you expect to deal with the corruption in Mpumalanga when you have the corruption at the apex of the leadership of the ruling party? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Now, if we're serious about violence, we all as citizens, then we have to be serious about the violence propagated by politicians at the level of parliament. Otherwise, it's never going to be dealt with. And it seems to me the same applies to corruption, the same applies to, to everything else. Otherwise, these become words 
they become words that we moan about, that commentators speak about on TV and anchors raise, but no one really believes anything will be done about it. Mm. Then we might as well say, the society is lost, let's all go out, we hire security, we make deals with gangs, and that's how we survive, like they survive in the DRC or in, in places that are immersed in complex violence mm -hmm. like, like Syria. Because I'm telling you, if we don't start getting our act together as a society, mm -hmm. we're going to go down that route because that's where we're heading. And I mean, Professor Habib, it's, it's not a very big jump from the statements you're making now to a conversation about the soul of our country. If we look at not only our levels of gender-based violence, but just the levels of violence that take place within those attacks. The attacks themselves are disturbing, but then you take a closer look at just the levels of depravity that go into the attacks on women and children in our country. And you talk about tracing that all the way up to the head, to the apex of leadership in our country. It's a very quick leap to what is happening in the soul of our nation. I mean, I, you know, I'm going to put it forcefully. I think our, the soul of a nation is poisoned. I think we are poisoned. Our soul is poisoned. I think it's important to say that if you take us as a nation, every year in January 8, you, run, you have the ANC running around saying the glorious movement. What glorious movement? This is no longer the movement of Tambo or Mandela. It is a poisoned movement and it's poisoned the soul of this, of this nation. And frankly, the opposition movements are not better. The EFF, which is, comes out of the ANC, is as poisoned as they come. And this call, just think about it at Seneca. You deploy uh, forces in Seneca. You've got angry white farmers who are angry, uh, and legitimately, I must say, angry at the murder of a young man who was hanged on a post, and then uh, you deploy other forces, and all you need is one. You've got a group of race, racists on both sides, and all you need is one person to pull out a gun and mm -hmm. fire, and we are going to have a serious altercation. More importantly, you have a police force who's incapable of managing anything. And in that kind of context, it's a completely irresponsible statement by a political leader. But it's not new. He's made a thousand of these over the year. And we laugh, we think it's a joke. This is no longer a joke. Like we used to laugh about Jacob Zuma and giggle about the way he reacted. Now we understood the consequence of it at ESCOM and Transnet and when blackouts happen and when water doesn't happen. The same thing is going to happen with, Jake, uh, with Julius Malema. We better as a nation start taking it seriously. And Cyril Ramaphosa has got to recognize, and I'll be, I'm honest with this, this is not Toronto. This is not New Zealand. You're not going to charm yourself into economic inclusion. You need firm leadership because it's a country whose soul is poisoned. Mm. And that's the message that South Africans need to hear. And uh, Prof, just some final comments for you as we, as we wrap up our interview. I mean, I want you to just talk about, um, you know, if we look at, you've mentioned the SOEs, the money we've lost, ESCOM, Danel, our other SOEs, state capture, a trillion rand set to have left our country through corrupt means over the past 10 years or so. If our leaders can act with impunity and face no consequence, what does that tell us as ordinary South Africans then? Well, that's right. It does tell us that actually the only way to do it is, is loot as much as you can because this is, uh, this is not a nation for the poor, the marginalized, as we pretend to be. It's a nation for yourself. You know, I'll, I'll, but, but the problem is not only the leadership. The problem is us. You know, we moan about the leadership. Who votes for this leadership? Who puts them in parliament? Who doesn't hold them accountable? Next year, there's a local government election. Who will smile about all of this? Who will take the food parcels? This will happen again because we get the leadership that we choose and we picked. 
That's the point that we have to un understand as citizens. This didn't happen because somebody uh, forced themselves on us. It happened because we are as complicit. I mean, we're talking about the unions. You talked about corruption earlier. The unions are as much political players implicated in this as everybody else. That's the problem. And that's what we've got to start taking seriously. Are we, as a country, ready to choose a leadership that we hold accountable, that we throw out when they, when they steal? I'll end off with this thing. Ten years ago, I was asked to speak at, a, at an event in Limpopo, ironically. And as I was speaking uh, on corruption and how corruption is a tax on the poor, and everybody gave me a standing ovation. And in the dinner, the after, one of the young officials in the government came to me and he said over dinner, you know what you academics don't really understand? Is corruption is a means of redistribution. Now, if that is what we believe, and if that is what our officials believe, then why are we so surprised that corruption has gone so rampant? We were stealing in the middle of a pandemic food parcels. Yeah. We're stealing protective equipment. VBS was stealing from the poor. There can be no more malevolent and poisonous a movement and a political class and an administrative class than ourselves. We are no better than the worst of the world. And I think it's time we recognize. Professor Adam Abib, thank you as always for giving us some incredible insight there. It's the issue of Senegal that we're discussing, but it says so much more about the heart of our country as a whole. Thanks again for your time this morning, Prof.